make your way, if you will, this evening to the book of Revelation. Go to chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I hope you're getting familiar with going there. That's what we've been doing the last couple of weeks, at least on Sunday mornings, as part of our fall focus. Let me say we do not intend to preach both in the morning and the evening from the book of Revelation. However, Max and I were talking last week about the possibility that it might help the Sunday morning lessons if we were to take a little bit of time and build sort of a working framework, if you will, around this book that might help some of those lessons in the mornings fit into Revelation to understand its context a little better and maybe help those lessons make a little bit more sense. And so I decided this evening that we would would spend a little time talking about the book and maybe trying to construct that framework, say a few basic things, overview kind of things that will help us with those lessons on Sunday morning. So there are three things that I thought we would do in our study together this evening. First of all, I want us to look at some things in chapter 1. Go to Revelation 1. Some things in chapter 1 that I think help us understand how to interpret the book correctly. Some guidelines, if you will, or some keys for interpreting the book. And then secondly, when we've done that, we'll, we'll pause and get in the story of the book. I think one of the things that makes the book so much easier to understand is to see the story that it's trying to tell. And then when we lay that out, we'll go back and we'll walk chapter by chapter from chapter 1 to chapter 22 all the way through and see how that story develops in the book. And Ben's over there thinking, he's going to preach for six hours tonight. How is he ever going to do that? That's a quarter of Bible classes. You got your watch ready? On the clock? Let's go. Let's talk about how we correctly understand the book. We've already mentioned that Revelation is awfully a misun- often a misunderstood book and that people even abuse the book. And I know to people sitting in a church building at 522 on a Sunday night, You and I don't want to do that. We want to be true to the Word of God. We want to handle this part of it correctly. So, if you look at chapter 1, I think we see some keys that help us do just that. Starting with this, if we're going to understand this book correctly, I think we have to keep in mind the style in which the book was written. It was written in the apocalyptic style, which means we can't read it like we would read the book of Acts, where we just read what it says and and, and that's what it means. You really can't do that with Revelation. Because the writer is employing signs and symbols to communicate his message. He tells us that straight up in chapter 1. Look down at verse number 12. Remember the vision Max talked about this morning? It opens with Jesus the magnificent Jesus, standing among what? What does verse 12 say? Standing among a bunch of lampstands, right? But now, look at that, and then go down to verse 20. And what are we told about those lampstands? In verse 20, we're told, actually, the lampstands aren't lampstands. They are symbols for the churches. Max rightly point out that at the very beginning of chapter 1, John says this message is going to be signified communicated by signs and symbols. And so when we're working with the book, we have to think about this dimension of it, this style that the writer is employing. Our job is to look at the picture that he paints and to pause and ask, well, what does this picture say? What is this symbol communicating? Why do we do that? Because it's the style of the book. We're told that straight up at the very beginning. And then secondly, if we're going to correctly interpret the book, we have to think about the time or what John says about the time. Are you still in chapter 1? Look at verse number 1. Do you see something there about how soon these things would happen? And when you found it there, look down at verse 3. Do you see it in verse 3? What John says about when these things will happen? John tells us, actually, He tells his audience that the things he's about to describe are things that will happen soon. And so when you and I begin to work with the signs and the figures and to figure out what they mean, we have to remember John's time. He says this stuff is going to happen soon. And add to that that we've got to think about his audience. We've already mentioned that, haven't we? Revelation is written to someone. Look down at verse number 4. Do you see it there? Chapter 1, verse 4. The audience is identified for us. The seven 
churches which are in Asia. We don't have to wonder which seven he's talking about because in verse 11, he actually names the seven churches. And then in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus addresses a personal message to each of them. And so we know who the audience of Revelation is. Why is that important? Well, as we go about looking at these symbols and trying to figure out what they mean, I would suggest we got to think about these people. Because before we do anything with it, we've got to figure out what it would mean to them before we can know what it will mean and how it will apply to us. By the way, that's what we do to every New Testament book. When we study the book of Ephesians, I don't read Ephesians like it was written to David Banning. I read Ephesians like it was written to... Ephesians, those people. And then once I know what it means to them, I figure out what it means to me. Same thing is true of Revelation. And then finally, number four, we need to think about the background. We've already talked a lot about that, haven't we? There are hints about the circumstances right in chapter 1. Can you look down at verse 9? Remember us talking about that last week? Last week? I, John, your fellow partaker in the tribulation, remember that, which is in Christ Jesus. And we know as we get deeper in the book, there's more about this trouble. And when we study the historical background, we know that there were circumstances. Disciples were being persecuted and killed in terrible ways. That was going on when the book was written. And so, and so as we read the book and we read about disciples suffering all kinds of terrible persecution, our first impulse should be to think about, well, this audience and their background. And as we begin to see things happening, we should assume that it's going to happen in that time because that's the time that John, <coughs> excuse me, the time that John has given us. In fact, as you look at that, you probably can begin to see the fatal flaw with all of these efforts to turn Revelation into some kind of a prophetic roadmap that's explaining what's going on with ISIS or what's happening in Russia or in Eastern Europe and all of that, we immediately see why there's a problem with the idea that there are Cobra helicopters described here, thermonuclear explosions. We know that's not right. It's fatally flawed. Why? Well, because that doesn't fit the background or the audience or John's time frame in any way at all. Do you see it? So if we hang on to the cues that John gives us right in chapter 1, well, they kind of serve as our guidelines. They direct us and help us to interpret the book correctly. So will you stick those away in the back of your mind as you work with this book? We've got to think about its style, what John says about the time, the audience it was written to, and their circumstances. Now, with those things before us, Let's take a look at the story. See, I'm already through point one. And y'all were thinking this is going to take too long. As I mentioned a minute ago, I think understanding the story really helps us begin to see the book and to understand its message. And actually, there is a chapter in the book that I think in that one chapter really gives you a picture of the whole story. It's chapter 6. Will you go there in your Bible? I want us to look at this together tonight. Look at Revelation chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background to set up what we're going to see in chapter 6. If I were to back up two chapters to chapter 4, John is allowed to peek into the control room of the universe. There's a door open and John's invited to go look in the door and there he sees God sitting on his throne. That's the chapter for next Sunday morning. I hope you'll come back for that lesson. It's an important chapter, okay? And as he looks into the control room of the universe, he sees God sitting on the throne. And then in chapter 5, Jesus is introduced, and we're told that, that God is holding a scroll, a scroll that is closed tightly, sealed up with seven seals, and Jesus is the only one who can open up this scroll. And so, in chapter 5, Jesus takes the book from the Father, and in chapter 6, he begins to break the seal and open up the scroll. And as each seal is broken, we get a little piece of information. And then another one, and we get some more information. And as you start putting together those pieces, you know what we get? We get the story of Revelation. So I want you to see that with me. Are you in chapter 6? Look at verse number 1. The first seal is broken, and what happens? 
John hears a voice that calls, and a horse, a white horse, comes riding across the scene. The rider, we're told, is carrying a bow, and he wears the victor's crown, and he's sent out conquering and to conquer. That's what he sees. That's the vision, the white horse carrying the conqueror. The question is, what does that symbolize? So it says, well, it's a horse, and John's riding on it. Yeah, 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 but remember back in chapter 1. John says, I'm going to be using symbols. So the question is, what does the horse symbolize? And I think when you put together the whole picture of chapter 6, what we come to conclude is that this white horse is a symbol for the gospel, going out and conquering the hearts of men. Maybe Max was right. He said this morning that it may be that Jesus is the rider of this horse, and that would certainly fit it. It would be appropriate for Jesus to be the one leading the way as the gospel goes out into the world to conquer the hearts of men. I think that's what's being envisioned here. And that's where Revelation begins with the gospel going out. But then look at verse 3. A second seal is broken. And again the voice calls. And another horse rides across the scene. This time it's a red horse that comes on the scene. And his rider carries a great sword. And his job is to take peace from the earth. That's what he sees. The question is, what does the red horse symbolize? I think the red horse is a symbol for the conflict that always follows the gospel. So I said, what are you talking about, David? Read the book of Acts. Think about that. Everywhere the gospel went, what inevitably followed. I mean, some people enthusiastically embraced the gospel and they became disciples, but many did not embrace the gospel. They were not only opposed to it, but some were violently opposed to it. And so it's interesting as you read Acts, not only do you have this great story of the progress of the gospel, but inevitably that's balanced by the problems and conflicts and troubles that went along with it. As the gospel goes forth, ladies and gentlemen, conflict always follows. In the book of Revelation, as the story unfolds, that's symbolized by a red horse. Now, you're still in chapter 6? Look at verse 5. Because Jesus is going to break another seal. And when he does, again the voice calls. And another horse, this time a black horse, comes riding across the scene. And as he rides across, there is this cryptic statement that is uttered. Are you still there? Look at verse number 6. This is chapter 6, verse 6. Here's what this statement says. A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. And we read that and we think... Boy, there's something in 1 Peter I really think I'd rather be reading right now, right? What does that mean? A little background might help here. A denarius was a Roman coin that financially would have been equivalent to about what a common laborer would be paid for a day's work. So you go out in a, man, in a man's field and you work for him for a full day, he would pay you a denarius. A quart of wheat is about enough wheat to feed one man for one day. So put that together. A man works all day and receives his entire wage, and it's just enough money for him to eat for that day. So what does the black horse symbolize? Adversity? Trouble, difficulty. I'm wondering if he's not a symbol for the suffering that the Christians would endure in this conflict. Later, we'll read in chapter 13 how they're unable to buy and sell because as Max was talking about this morning, they wouldn't go along with the emperor's demand to be worshipped. So they had a hard time buying food for their family and taking care of their family, hard time being able to eat. Perhaps that's what our black horse is symbolizing, the suffering that follows. And then, and then in chapter 6 and verse 7, Another seal is broken, and a gruesome scene unfolds. This time, a pale horse is called and crosses the stage of activity, and we're told death is riding him, and not far behind is Hades, and we're told that they have authority to kill. Now, if, if we've been right up to this point in what we've described, it's not hard to figure out what this is, right? 
Because we've watched the gospel go out. We've seen the conflict that followed. We see God's people suffering persecution because of that. And now, and now persecution reaches that most awful end with disciples being killed because of their faith. Now, if you look ahead to the next seal, the fifth seal, I think our conclusion there is only confirmed because when the fifth seal is broken, John sees a great altar. Probably the Old Testament altar of sacrifice, that great bronze altar out in front of the tabernacle where their sacrifices would be brought and killed. And when the sacrifice would be killed, the blood would flow down and collect into the altar. And you're thinking, we didn't need that extra detail there. Yeah, we really do, because look at verse 9. This time when the sacrifice is offered, it is not blood that pools under the altar, but the souls of the martyrs. And they are crying out, verse 10 says. How long, O Lord? The question that was hanging in the air as people watched the Roman Empire crush disciples, the question that was hanging in the air is how long is God going to put up with this? And that's being envisioned here with the breaking of the fifth seal. Their blood cries for justice. And the question is, when is God going to do something about this? Do you see his answer? In verse 11, his answer is, not now. In fact, more are going to die. You know, folks, sometimes that's the way it is. God has promised to answer our prayers, but God answers our prayers in his time and in his way. And as disciples at this time cried out to him, God says, I will answer I will respond, but it is not going to be now. And more will die. And then, the sixth seal is broken. Verse 12. I'm going to read this one. Would you look at this with me? Chapter 6, verse 12. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake and the sun became like sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a, a fig tree casts its unripe fruit when it is shaken by a great wind. And, and the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free men hid themselves in the, in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains, and they said, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And, and who is able to stay? It is a scary scene that is painted when the sixth seal is broken. It is a section feel, filled with, with judgment language, lar largely borrowed from the, from the Old Testament prophets. You've been reading the prophets this year, right? It's language. It's in there again and again. And it would be describing how God, back in Old Testament days, was going to rise up and come against the, the Assyrians or come against the Babylonians or sometimes come against the Israelites in judgment, in punishment. Same language we see here is used there. And so the question is, as the sixth seal is broken and we see this judgment scene, the question is, what does it symbolize? This is what John sees, but what does it say? And I think what it says is a judgment's coming. Now, this isn't final judgment, okay? This isn't the judgment at the end of time where all men go before God and answer for his life. This is the same kind of judgment that the Old Testament prophets talk about God coming in judgment of the nations, except in this book, it is that nation, the Roman Empire, the one that's persecuting his people. God has just told his people in verse 11, I'm not coming now, not yet. But I want you to notice, folks, when that sixth seal is broken, 
God says, but I am coming. Can you see it? Judgment may not be immediate, but judgment is sure. God is going to deal with these people that are persecuting his people when that time is right. And that's the story of Revelation, I think, from beginning to end. Gospel has gone forth into the world. Conflict has followed. God's people are being persecuted because of their faith. Some are even dying and their souls are crying out for justice. Their blood cries for justice. And God says, in my time, I'm going to come and give you justice. In one chapter, we have the whole story. With the story before us, Let's do one more thing tonight. I'm already on the last point, Ben. You still got me on the clock, buddy? <laughs> Amazing how parents corrupt their children. <laughs> I want to do one more thing. I want us to take that story and let's go to the book now. And let's find the story as we walk through the chapters of the book, and then we'll be done with our study tonight. So let's begin with chapter number one. Max already took care of this for me this morning. I don't need to say a lot about that, right? Because it's in chapter one that we meet the mighty Jesus. That's the primary thing there. The opening act in Revelation is the vision of Jesus. He's their leader. He's their, their, their hero. He's going to come to their rescue, and he's He's introduced in all of his glory in chapter 1. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we have those letters where Jesus sends a personal message to each of the churches that he is addressing in this letter. And I think the letters have a twofold purpose, at least. First, they remind these people that God is with them. And he knows what's going on with them. He's aware of their circumstances and their situation. And then the second thing I think the letters do is they, they, they begin to prepare the churches for what's coming. Listen, Jesus fusses at some of these churches. They've got problems and issues. And listen, you don't want to be in the middle of a church fuss when someone's about to drop a rock on your head, and that's what's coming. So he says, you need guys need to batten down the hatches. You need to pull this together. You need to get your act together so you will be prepared to weather the storm that's coming. That's chapters two and three. And then in chapter four, he's allowed to peek through that open door into heaven. And what does he see? The great control room of the universe, there's a throne sitting there, and guess what? Domitian isn't on it. God is still on his throne. I want to say so much about that, but then I don't know what I'd preach next Sunday morning, okay? You just have to come back Sunday morning for that one. He sees God on his throne Chapter 5, the lamb is introduced as the one who's worthy to open the scroll that God is holding, the scroll that tells the story, the scroll that tells the outcome. That's why there's so much drama in chapter 5. Someone's got to open this up. Someone's got to tell us what's going to happen because it's how the story comes out. And so as we saw in chapter 6, the scroll is open and the story is told. The whole story, right there. At the end of chapter 6, that last seal is broken and you have that awful judgment scene, right? Must have been kind of hard for those disciples to hear, don't you imagine? About this awful judgment that was coming on the nation that they lived in. If you look at chapter 6, the last verse of chapter 6, are you looking there? The last verse, there's a question that's raised. When that judgment comes, who will be able to stand? And so, as we move into chapter 7... That question is answered. There's a break in the action so God can reassure his people that he's going to take care of them and bring them through this crisis. But once he's given that word or that word of comfort, he moves on and begins to act. Let me suggest to you that Revelation is real easy if you watch for three series of seven. We've already looked at one of them, right? In chapter six, we have seven seals. It's all right to speak. Seven seals that hold the scroll closed. That's the first series of seven. In chapter eight, we're about to see that there are seven trumpets of warning. And then after the seven trumpets of warning, out of that last trumpet, there will come seven bowls of the wrath of God. If you watch for those three things, seals, trumpets, bowls of wrath, that's the book of Revelation. That's a story. Three series of seven. So, after this break where God says, 
don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. And you need to know that because, beginning in chapter 8, the trumpets start sounding. And as each trumpet of warning sounds, there is a calamity that God brings on this terrible empire. But this isn't his judgment, not his ultimate judgment. What God is doing in 8 and 9 with the trumpets of warning is he is is warning. His, His purpose is to try to bring these people to repentance, to get them to back up and consider their ways and and change their ways. That's what God wants. Do you remember back in chapter 6? God says in verse 11, he tells his people, I'm coming, but I'm not coming now. And maybe you wondered, why would God ever wait? If these people are doing this awful stuff to his disciples, why wouldn't he come right now and deal with that? And in chapters 8 and 9, we learn the answer. You know those people who are killing Christians? Jesus loves them too. And his death on the cross was for Domitian too. And before he's going to judge, he's going to do everything he can to get these people that he loves to repent. And so, there are seven trumpets of warning to which the people will be unresponsive. And so God's wrath is coming. However, before his wrath comes, beginning in chapter 10, what we have is a break in the action. It's a lengthy uh, break in the action. All the way from chapter 10 to chapter 15. What's going on in that break period? Well, one of the important things that happens is we meet all the enemies. I mean, he's alluded to them periodically already, but we get up close and personal with all of the bad guys beginning in this break period between chapter 10 and chapter 15. So in chapter 12, we meet the great dragon. Dustin pointed out to me that I called him the red dragon last week. He called me out on that. So I thought, well, I'll just go and show him where that's in the text. There's only one problem. It's not there. I don't know why I called him the red dragon. I just kind of think he is. But the Holy Spirit didn't say that he is. So we're clear on that point, right? So the great dragon, I said it right tonight just for Dustin. The great dragon, he's a symbol for Satan. He's the bad guy who's behind all of this. He's introduced to us in chapter 12. In chapter 13, we meet two beasts. The first one rises out of the sea. I think this beast is a symbol, if you look at what's said about it, a symbol for the Roman Empire, especially its political power as epitomized in its evil emperor Domitian. In fact, to be honest with you, that beast may just be a symbol for Domitian. And then you move a little further in the chapter, there's a second beast, one that rises out of the earth. Later in the book, John gives him another name, calls him the false prophet, and I think that's perfect because he's clearly a symbol for Rome's false religion, especially that part of Rome's false religion that forced people to worship the emperor. And so in 13, we have these two beasts. Then in 14, there is another enemy, a prostitute named Babylon. And I believe the prostitute is a symbol for the immorality that existed in the Roman Empire. There are your enemies, folks. Disciples were living in a world where the devil has harnessed the power, the political power of Rome, the false religion of Rome, the immorality of that empire, and he's getting them all to make war with the people of God. Worried about that? Don't be. Because once you know who the enemies are, and once God has sounded the trumpet and give them a chance to repent, and they don't repent, then God's ready to take action. And so in chapter 15, there's this dramatic build up to chapter 16 when God pours out those seven bowls full of his wrath and he destroys his enemies. Beginning in chapter 17, we have, well, we have two contrasting visions. First, there is a picture of the devastation that God brings on these terrible enemies and They're all grieving and mourning. Those who allied with the wrong side, they're grieving and mourning. But that's contrasted in this section with the people of God who are celebrating victory. Their cause has been vindicated. So you get the negative picture 
and the positive picture. In fact, what happens in 17, 18, 19, remember those four enemies? We were introduced to the dragon and then the two beasts and then the prostitute and then beginning in 17, we read about the fall of the prostitute and, and then the, the two beasts. And by the time we get to chapter 20, there's one last enemy to deal with. The last enemy in chapter 20 is the devil. You can't finish his story because he wouldn't be done when Rome was done. He, he, he had that tool taken out of his hands, but he's going to go and he's going to find other tools and he will keep battling just like he's fighting me and you today. That goes on all the way until ultimately at the end of time, God deals with him. And that's what chapter 20 is about. And since God has gone all the way to the end of the time to tell us about the devil's ultimate fate, the closing picture in chapter 21, 22 is the positive picture of the people of God at home with God when this life is over. It's a picture of heaven. It's a picture of victory. So in the weeks ahead, on Sunday morning, as we start pulling out chapter 4 and talking about the throne scene, chapters 21 and 22, and talking about heaven and that symbol for victory, I hope you'll have a sense of how all of those pieces go together to form a beautiful tapestry that reminds the people of God that no matter what's happening in a moment in a snapshot of time here on earth, we are on the winning team. We need to stay on the winning team. So much hope, so much comfort, in this great message. I want to close with that tonight. You remember at the end of chapter 6, after that awful scene of judgment, there is a question? The question is, with God's judgment coming, who will be able to stand in the face of that? And chapter 7 answers the question. It first shows this great crowd of people, all who have the seal of God on their forehead. It's a way of saying God knows who his people are. And then later in that same chapter, those people are envisioned at home with God in heaven. There's their ultimate destiny. It's God's way of saying, I don't want you to worry about anything that's coming. I'll be with you all the way through. And I'll bring you home to heaven. You just need to stay with me. There's our question. We'll be able to stand in the end we will stay with him. Are you doing that tonight? We're going to sing this song as a song of encouragement, but that's the question, brothers and sisters, that's hanging in the air. Have you stayed with Jesus? If you're a disciple and you cannot look at your life and say, I have been faithful to him, and you know tonight in your heart you're not on the right side, you need to get on the right side. The one you know is going to win. And if you've never joined his side, if you've never become a disciple, you're on the team that's guaranteed to lose and lose in the worst way. You don't want to be with that crowd in the end. So you've got to decide to not be with them today. If you need to respond to the Lord, become his follower, we want to help you do that. You can let us know by coming to the front. Come right now. Let's stand. Let's sing.